Okay. Um, and the other thing I'm going to do is uh, be the timekeeper. And let me demonstrate what that is going to sound like. Um, after about four minutes and four and a half minutes, uh, you'll hear a sound from my computer. And you'll know that you have about 30 seconds left. Did everyone hear that, all the speakers? You didn't hear it, Jess? And you're first up. Um, I'm not sure what I can do about that. Did anyone hear it? No. Okay. Maybe I have to actually share my screen and share the sound in order for it to play. Uh, you know what? I'll, I'll use my phone. That will be easier. I really hope my student assistant arrives soon. That works. Okay, good. Uh, so I'm going to go into my office. This will be so much easier there. <laughs> and I will give you a go ahead. And um, I will ask you to introduce yourself speakers and hope that you all have the the running list of um, the order anyone have any questions about the order okay all right jess you are ready to go Great, thank you, Allison. Let me share my screen. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, wonderful. And we're seeing the screen okay? Yep. Okay. So hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, inviting me to speak today. Uh, my name is Jessica Crossfield McIntosh, and I'm with the Health Sciences Library at Ohio State, um, and I'm the engagement strategist for the Ohio Innovation Exchange. So this is going to be a talk of the collaborative approach, enhancing research management through library partnerships. I'm going to share about a statewide initiative to support research management and how a team of librarians are working to engage with the Ohio Innovation Exchange. So what is a RIM and how does it relate to OIEX and libraries? To give us a shared definition from an OCLC report defining RIM and the library's role, Research information management is the aggregation, curation, and utilization of metadata about research activities. This metadata can be used to trace things like activities and outputs for researchers and their affiliations, publications, data sets, patents, grants, academic service, honors, and statements of impact. RIM systems are valuable to research institutions because they combine the local with the global, providing opportunities for new insights at the departmental, faculty, college, and institutional level. The Ohio Innovation Exchange, or OIEX as I will refer to it, is a statewide RIM system that's in development, funded and supported by the Ohio Department of Higher Education. The platform brings statewide academic resources into a single searchable platform in the fields of biomedical, natural, and physical sciences, engineering, technology, and mathematics. The goal of the Ohio Innovation Exchange is to enhance efficiency for collaborators or companies to quickly find and connect with faculty, researchers, equipment, or labs. Researchers can also use OIEX as an online research profile while accessing impact metrics and scholarship. So where do libraries come in? Also from the OCLC report, this uh, quote emphasizing the importance of library involvement in these systems suggests how beneficial it is to have librarians working to enhance this type of platform. 
In addition, based on other successful models of statewide RIM platforms, Florida ExpertNet being one of them, OIEX leadership knew that library engagement and involvement had been crucial to adoption and improvement of a RIM system. This brings us to the Library Engagement Advocacy and Planning Task Force, also known as LEAP, as it's kind of a mouthful. This task force was brought together in early 2021 and is comprised of 12 librarians from nine institutions. Some of these institutions are already embedded in OIEX, some are on their way in, and some are looking at possible addition in the future. The group is working together for about eight months and giving their time and service to engage with uh, and enhance OIEX. So to touch on some of the highlights of what LEAP is working on, uh, connecting with academic departments and liaison groups, expanding work in bibliometrics and scholarly communication, supporting faculty in growing and measuring uh, research impact, promoting collaborations with institutional research and corporate leadership, and then providing a final report of recommendations to the Ohio Department of Higher Education. Uh, and these goals are largely integrated into the work that many of us do as liaisons to our departments. So far, the group has gone through a discovery phase where we've explored the platform, a strategic doing process to determine priorities and are now broken up into task groups meeting monthly to begin working on individual projects that will be incorporated into a toolkit. We also plan for future engagement to enhance continued development. And as we know, cross-institutional partnerships are beneficial in multiple ways as we are all here in a boot camp together um, designed to learn from one another. So benefits from these collaborations include expertise and insight from a variety of institutions, liaison and discipline experience that guides different approaches and broad awareness and engagement to help support and develop OIEX. And as LEAP continues to work toward their goals, spread awareness of OIEX and help design new resources for their campuses, we can see these benefits come to light in support of this system. So thank you for your time. I should be right under five minutes. Um, if you have any questions about OIEX or LEAP, uh, you can email me, jessica.mackintosh at osumc.edu. Thank you. Yes, you were just under five minutes. <laughs> yes. Um, Danny, can we entertain like one question per person, do you think, or do we need to race on to the next? Yeah, we have a tiny bit of wiggle room. So if there's time, one question while Eric's pulling up. And if you have a question for Jess, you could just unmute yourself. Okay. So Eric, you're all set to go. I am ready. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. And all we right. can see your slides. Great. Go ahead. I'm going to start my timer here. And good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Eric Tans, and I am the Science Collections Coordinator and the Environmental Sciences Librarian at Michigan State University. And uh, my talk today is on how we are building climate resilience in our community through the library at MSU. Uh, I'd like to start things off by defining some key, a key term so that everyone uh, can be on the same page. And I will use the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions definition for climate resilience, which is the ability to anticipate, prepare for, and respond to hazardous events related to climate. So these hazardous events related to climate can happen no matter where you live and our warming climate makes them more frequent and intense. So where I live here in Michigan, uh, we can have snow and ice and extreme cold in the winter time, heat and tornadoes in the summer and flooding pretty much any time of the year. Uh, other areas might experience wildfires, rising sea levels, or hurricanes, just to name a few other climate related threats. So what can libraries do? Your library can support climate resilience in your community by becoming part of a network of climate resilience hubs. Hubs are community institutions that help their communities prepare for and respond to extreme weather events. In a program, it's a program put on by the nonprofit Communities Responding to Extreme Weather or crew. Mainly hubs engage with the public to share information on preparing for extreme weather 
and linking weather to climate change. Just a little bit more about Crew. They are a nonprofit based in Boston, Massachusetts, with a goal to build up communities so that they can emerge even stronger despite climate change events. So the MSU Libraries became a climate resilience hub in 2020 through a grant funded partnership with Crew and the American Library Association called Resilient Communities, Libraries Respond to Climate Change. We are now part of a growing network of more than 40 hubs in the United States and Canada. So here's a map of all the hubs taken from earlier this spring with the helpful red arrow pointing to MSU in Michigan. So the program requirements for, for hubs are fairly simple. Uh, you'll need to display a window decal at the building's entrance, provide information on climate change and extreme weather to the public and host at least one event each year on climate preparedness. And CREW supplies informational flyers to share with the public in both print and online formats. Uh, all hubs are currently uh, at the, the level one level, um, but CREW plans to introduce additional levels in the near future. The MSU library will be exploring the possibility of moving up to level two which would mean we would serve as a community resource during extreme weather events, uh, offering cooling to, to community members during heat waves or, or warming in, in blizzards and things like that. Because MSU has its own dedicated campus power plant and an underground steam driven utility infrastructure, it's extremely rare for our campus to lose power, making us a perfect resource when the power goes out across the rest of our region. Uh, to learn more, you can check out the MSU Library Climate Resilience Hub LibGuide, uh, and you can find uh, future climate projections from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, find and follow tips on emergency preparedness from ready.gov, and learn how to get involved with CREW, including the necessary steps for your library to become a climate resilience hub for your community. Uh, I'd be happy to respond to any questions, uh, either during a Q&A, or you can feel free to reach out directly to me uh, at tans at msu.edu. And thanks for your time. Thank you, Eric. Um, I, I have a quick question. Um, I assume the slide you showed of people in a room was one of your required events, and it looks like it was pretty well attended. Uh, that slide, uh, it was an event, but it wasn't at our library. I got these slides from uh, from Crew, um, oh, okay. and so that was from another library. But we, I had an event earlier in the spring through our science festival. Uh, we have an annual science festival, and I had a, an event there that wasn't as well attended as that picture. Thank you. All right, Melanie. Yes, hello. Can you hear me all right? Uh, yes, I, we can. Very good. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, well, hello. I'm Melanie Sorrell, the science librarian at UNC Charlotte's Atkins Library, and it's good to be with all of you virtually. Uh, I created an exhibit to help others understand how the origins of vaccines change the course of world history. This year is the 225th anniversary of Dr. Edward Jenner's vaccination of little James Phipps with an animal pox, and then the subsequent challenge six weeks later with smallpox. So why the 225th anniversary? Well, simply because I was not working at the Atkins Library for the bicentennial celebration. And I wish Dr. Jenner's contribution to vaccinology could be recognized every year. However, it, uh, it was a timely coincidence that led to the exhibit being planned in 2019 and then being created concurrently with the development of the COVID-19 vaccine. But there are actually two exhibits in this project. The main floor exhibit is seen here on the right and the welcome poster has a QR code at the bottom linking to the digital exhibit. 
The exhibit cases display items such as antique medical books from special collections, monographs from the general collection about the history of smallpox, and printouts from electronic materials about the development of modern vaccines. The, the long practice variolation with smallpox scabs or lesion material was dangerous. So vaccination with animal pox, you know, likely cowpox, began. Uh, Jenner was not the first to use animal pox, but was the first to follow that vaccination with a challenge using smallpox material and then write it up. Uh, Jenner's legacy really began with his 1798 publication that described the successful vaccination. It's freely available, and four of those pages were printed out, placed in the second exhibit case, and shown here. The library's graphic artist illustrated the storyboards depicting the differences between the centuries-old variolation and Jenner's vaccination. The exhibit cases also have items that tell the story of smallpox outbreaks in Charlotte in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And the fifth and last case includes information on vaccine development for other diseases. Vintage postage stamps shown here uh, from around the world commemorating Dr. Louis Pasteur's rabies vaccine and work in other aspects of microbiology were kindly loaned by a professor from the Department of Chemistry. We also added a January 7th, 2021 news article about the first day the COVID-19 vaccine was distributed in Charlotte. Now, these bird's eye view photographs were made by the library's photographer who took the pictures left to right and then stitched them together using Adobe Photoshop. So these pictures are on the first page of the digital exhibit for those who are unable to come to campus or just want to read additional information. The digital exhibit is a research guide on the Spring Share platform. There are several pages to the research guide. For those unfamiliar with smallpox, I included a picture of an affected patient from more than a century ago. At the image size of the smallpox patient was minimized for those who are unaccustomed to viewing medical images. Other pages discuss cowpox as a disease, uh, early vaccine distribution, and the molecular makeup of 19th and 20th century smallpox vaccine, which was actually often horsepox. But for those Edward Jenner fans who want to make a pilgrimage to where history was made, uh, his home has been turned into a museum. Uh, tourists can see the little hut where Jenner performed his weekly vaccinations for the poor. So this special exhibit was an opportunity to chronicle the beginning of the modern public health movement and the life of Dr. Edward Jenner, one of the most famous scientists in medical history. So thank you. And if anyone has a, a question, I'd be uh, happy to talk more about the exhibit or Dr. Jenner. Thank you, Melanie. It looks like a really wonderful exhibit in both physical and virtual form. Oh, well, thank you. Um, and we could, uh, you, there, the exhibit page is noted here in the chat. Yes. Great. Thank you. Lois is next. Are you, are you all set to go, Lois? I am all set. Okay, go ahead. Do we see the screen sharing here? Uh-huh. Okay. Let's see, let's go back to the beginning here. Well, hello, I'm with a group of librarians who uh, have research data management and archival experience um, and we began examining the research practice of life scientists in order to understand their practices regarding historic analog data. We were interested in how to make analog data more findable, accessible, discussing preservation and access issues with liaison departments, faculty and graduate students, and working with researchers to identify solutions. Findings from our work show that older data in paper or analog format held in labs, offices, and archives across research institutions are often an overlooked resource 
for potential use in new scientific studies. However, there are a few mechanisms to help researchers find existing analog data in order to reuse it. In our research, we define analog data as non-digital data, primarily in print, such as field books, lab notebooks, ledgers, data sheets, photos, maps, slides, and so forth. It does not include physical specimens, such as soil or tissue samples or herbariums, but would include any analog data describing these physical specimens. These analog sources were common repositories for data into the 1990s. Our interviews show that these analog items are still found across campus and the data they include is of value to researchers in biodiversity, geology, plant science and climate science, among others. Scientists who often use historic data in analog format as part of their current work. With many stewards of this historic analog data nearing retirement, the loss of this data is a concern as well as the loss of its contextual information. Beyond its mere continued existence, other issues with historic analog data include the lack of descriptive metadata, the challenge of finding avenues that allow analog data to be discovered, since most data repositories require that data be machine readable. We sent a survey to 772 researchers and faculty in the colleges of biological sciences, food, agriculture, and natural resources, and extension at the University of Minnesota to understand and explore current and potential future use of historic data. <clears throat> Excuse me, attitudes around sharing and re reusing data and preservation of the data. We had 108 responses, 14%, and 69% of respondents had analog data in their possession. We asked where they physically stored in a select all that apply question and the majority stated it was in their office, in their labs or elsewhere on campus. Several indicated that their data was off site at their home or a graduate student had it. Another person stated it was at the home of a friend in India, too expensive to bring back. Based on our survey responses, we found that there was 1,414 linear feet or four football fields of historic data on our campus. Most researchers had reused or shared it. Many continued to add to their data sets. Some data had been scanned. Over half of researchers had rekeyed some of their data into machine readable format, but nearly all that were converted to digital format were stored on unstable platforms or in legacy formats. Of the 61 respondents who answered this question, some did not quantify an amount of data, just replying dozens of boxes or some. The remaining 55 respondents had a individual totals ranging from 0.2 linear feet to 864 linear feet. We've tested various solutions in this work, working in conjunction with researchers at various types of scale from the example above, where we worked with an individual researcher to our work on a large 100-year-old data set of analog fruit breeding data, which involved capturing metadata about each data set, identifying data sets at risk for loss, and digitizing select items for deposit in our institutional repository. Without intervention, people may not be aware that such data exists, and it may be at loss of risk, risk of loss. We want to raise awareness of an analog data's existence and its utility in order to prompt others to investigate the feasibility of similar work at their institutions. Currently, produced digital data sets are subject to guidelines and requirements developed at a national level. Solutions for historic analog data could benefit from similar high-level treatment, and it will take experts from various fields to lead this effort. Given librarians' expertise on data management and preservation, librarians are in a position to collaborate on devising cross-disciplinary solutions. Please feel free to con connect with us if you are working on analog data projects. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi there, can everybody hear me? No. 
Kristen, that was you speaking. Yes. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yes. Can you hear okay. us? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Um, right. I was uh, just waiting one moment to see if there was anyone who had a question. <laughs> Lois. Um, and Melanie, do you have a question? I, no, I was responding to her question about if we could hear her. Okay, great. All right. Well, then, um, Kristen, why don't you go ahead and get started? Okay, thanks. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Kristen Adams, the science and engineering librarian at Miami University Libraries in Ohio. And the name of my talk is Research Data Management Throughout a Rock's Life uh, with Humans. Since rocks have super long lives, we can't get into all that in, in five minutes. Um, so, the field is where it all starts for geologists' work. Um, the field is where the rocks come from. And if you know how to read the rocks, then you can interpret them and um, ascertain the geological history of the area. And um, throughout the talk, down at the bottom, we have the research data life cycle from data one. And the field work photos here are from a research project that I was a part of um, in north central Wyoming. So, Stage one is the planning process. And if you're going out into the field, then there's a lot of logistical things that you need to um, plan for. You also need to do a literature review for the, the work that has been in, in that area, but also work that has been done with similar research methods. And if you're using a data management plan, either one that's required from your funding agency or because you just feel like it's a good idea, then you'll need to get your ducks in a row to do that during this initial planning stage. Uh, moving on to data collection. When geologists are out in the field, they do a lot of data collection um, in a lot of different ways. The rocks and sediment samples are one thing that they collect. If you go back into the field, then you're going to want to have those when you come back into the lab. And if you're doing a data management plan that requires that maybe your specimens have unique IDs on them, then there's a couple of different registrations that you can do for those, the SEERs and the ISGNs. Um, you're also going to collect some photographs and some GPS data. GPS data is really important, but that's typically not enough. Um, if you're at an outcrop, then the rocks at the bottom and the rocks at the top are different stratigraphically, so you need to record that as well. And generally, that's done in a field notebook, which is like in the photo there. It's just a paper notebook um, that you use to record all of your notes and things like that. There are some software options available that if you have um, some sort of electronic device that you prefer to use, and you can do that and store all the photos in there. But there's issues with taking technology out into the field like battery life and the, the screen brightness and things like that. So a lot of people still prefer the paper notebooks for taking notes. So when you get back into the lab from the field, then all of the data is synthesized. Um, your rock specimens might be turned into slides, for example, and then you have those as well and you start doing computer analysis. So then you have a mix of some physical samples and data and some um, digital files as well. So what happens to all of that data um, after the research project is over? A lot of us are familiar with digital materials and data sets and photos and articles. They go into digital repositories, an institutional repository or a disciplinary specific repository. And we have fair data standards for those kinds of things now. Um, lots of set metadata schemas and things like that so that it, it's findable for other people to use. Um, but the physical materials also need something akin to that, um, but it gets a little bit more complicated when you have rocks, slides, field notebooks, and all of these other things. Um, a lot of those get stored in personal storage. Some of them sometimes go to museums or state geological surveys or other kinds of repositories. And the cataloging systems are mainly local standards. And just because of the diversity of specimens that you have, it's just easier to do it that way. Um, and that's been happening for a lot longer than the digital files. And one of the issues we run into for either the digital stuff or the analog stuff is that there's space limitations. Um, there's also a risk of loss for either of these. For digital files, a lot of us are familiar with bitrot and format, format obsolescence, but this can happen with physical specimens as well. Um, a lot of people think that rocks are rocks and you can just sit it on a shelf and it'll be fine for years and decades, and that's not always the case. There's a lot of degradation that can happen. In the picture here, we have an ammonite that has been piratized. And pyrite in particular can degrade really quickly, and it turns into the, the mess there that you can see in the drawer. And if you've got your 
metadata, if you will, on a little paper label that's in that box, and that's what it turns into, then, then that's lost, and, and then the specimens don't have as much use as they used to. So that's what happens when preservation kind of goes a little bit wrong. But to end on a positive note, a data rescue operation um, that has happened by the Biodiversity Heritage Library in Australia is that they have um, some historic field notebooks from geologists that went to Antarctica, and they have rescued those and scanned them and put in all sorts of metadata so that they are findable for scientific and historical value. And that's what I have. Thanks for listening. Great. Thank you, Kristen. Sure. These are really interesting slides. Um, the, the, you know, I don't have a chance to go out in the field very often, so it's really nice to see that you were able to do that. Any questions for Kristen? Rebecca notes that it's painful to look at specimen lost. It is. Yeah, it is. You have to be careful with the cleanup for those as well, because those can be hazardous chemicals. So, right. Okay, I think that Rebecca is ready to go. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. All right. Um, hello, my name is Rebecca Hedry, and I am a science librarian at Southern Connecticut State University in New Haven, Connecticut. After several decades of library work, I decided to go back to my first love, biology, and get a graduate. A biology degree, and my advisor and I came up with a very librarian-ish biology project. A good deal of ecological work is limited by the amount and longitudinal extent of existing data. It's hard to compare current data to historical trends if those trends only go back a few years. Limitations in historical data are one of the prime foci of the field of historical ecology, and my project explores whether a set of narrative reports originally aimed at the public can be analyzed to produce actual data of a sort that could be compared to other scientific uh, data collections. The Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection has been putting out a weekly report since at least the mid-1990s about what's biting where in the Long Island Sound and surrounding areas, listing species, locations, and sometimes sizes. The collection of this information is standardized, Every week during the fishing season, roughly April through October, someone goes out and talks to bait shop proprietors, starter boat crews, and individual fishers to find out what they've been catching and seeing. This local knowledge also allows for prediction over the years. Since 2006, the DEP has produced the report as a newsletter, and before that, the report was published in a local paper every week during the fishing season. The newsletters are archived at our state library, and the newspapers are available via ProQuest. Each mention of a species and location, species and measurement, or species location and measurement was coded as a new entry in an Excel spreadsheet. This is known as an occurrence in ecology speak. Frankly, I underestimated the amount of data I would produce. Um, in the end, I extracted almost 23,000 data points consisting of, at minimum, a species and date, but with a large percentage of locations specific enough to be geocodable, and a solid fraction with some measurement data as well. 63 species and 329 places were identifiable. The map uh, on this slide shows the, the range of places minus one spot that I think is up in Maine. So how useful are the data? Okay, the project was strictly to evaluate the potential of the method, but I couldn't resist having a look at the data. And I was able to produce a basic trend in the growth of juvenile bluefish, which could be used to compare cohorts from year to year. And I also looked at maximum recorded weights, which remained relatively flat over the course of a decade of data. The Connecticut reports go back at least another decade and similar New York reports covering Long Island Sound go back into the 1960s. Similar reports exist for other areas of the eastern seaboard, such as the Chesapeake Bay, so there's plenty of potential for this project to expand. A recent comment provided another possible use for this data set. This could be used as a training set for text mining, which would make the expansions of the project much more feasible. Um, I'm also using my project as a demo for data sharing. The method should be applicable to any set of regular narratives that are produced systematically. 
newsletters, diary entries, field notes. The important part is whether or not the data backing up the notes were collected in some sort of methodical way, whether or not the data is currently collated in a scientific fashion. So I urge you to look into your archives, your government archives, your government documents and your historical logs and diaries to see if there's potential data sources to help inform historical ecology work. Thank you. Um, if anyone has questions, please contact me. I am always happy to discuss my work. Wow, that's um, pretty amazing uh, archive of data. And I can see that it would be very useful for comparison with current fish stocks and well the just the biological data in general as well as the physical data christine or notes is a treasure trove of information yes Maybe. larger projects um, are impossible to do on your own <laughs> um, and as i said this one may have turned out to be a little bigger than i probably should have taken on on my own <laughs> And I just have to ask, your background uh, is a illustration from a book, right? Uh, yes, this is um, from the Library of Congress. Um, it is a um, cabinet of curiosities. Okay, I, I thought it actually looked familiar. Yeah. All right, good, thank you. Um, we will move on to, there's something else in the chat. Move on to um, Renee. There we go, you can see your slides. Okay, fantastic. And I assume you can hear me too? Yes, indeed, go ahead. Yeah, wonderful. Well, so good to be here with you today. And the my lightning round is gonna be on scoping reviews at a glance. I'm Renee Tanner. I'm at Arizona State University at the moment. And starting August 2nd, I'll be at Rollins College as a um, science librarian and head of research services. So a period of transition. So we have a number of tools that we can use to evaluate large bodies of research and medical research in particular. And that would be environmental scans, rapid reviews, scoping reviews, and systematic reviews. And again, what I'm gonna be focusing on is scoping reviews and how we can get more confident as librarians and helping our students use those. So what is a scoping review and how is it different similar to a systematic review? Well, it turns out the scoping reviews and systematic reviews have a lot of similarities, but how they're different is a scoping review is really for broad topics. So it's, it could be broad and complex, exploratory. So it may not have a lot of research actually already done in terms of these meta-analyses. Um, so that is what I worked on with a uh, student who was getting her, her doing a thesis for her honors college work. And she reached out to me in the summer of 2020 during the pandemic. And she was interested in looking at how telehealth was changing and being used to help with the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, she said, hey, would you be my thesis advisor? And I thought, oh boy, I've never done that before, but I knew that I had a lot of support. So I, we've got a, a health sciences librarian here at ASU. Her name is Janice Hermer. And she met with us and I knew I had the support of a professor at ASU, um, Jane Meinshine. So we started out, we said, well, we've got to do a, a, a limiting view of this picture. So we decided just for the year of 2020, she was going to study this. She was going to only look at scholarly publications and look at telehealth in terms of the technology as well as the services that were being provided. And here is where that uh, really got good and that we had guidance. So there's a, a guideline called PRISMA, and it's for scoping reviews and meta-analyses, and it really guides us through the process. And so how it guides us is the first step is to identify those databases that you're going to use and get your keywords. And those keywords don't change. Once you decide on the keywords, you stay with them the whole process. And so then after you have this body of, of work that you've collected, then you screen it based on the title and the abstract. And then you look even further at its eligibility based on your criteria. And that is, you have to look at 
the, at the articles themselves. And so then you end up with a body of research that is going to be the basis of your scoping review. So back to my student, Andrea Block. She decided on PubMed and the Library OneSearch as her databases that she would look at. She developed her keywords, which were all related to telehealth, and they were, you know, in the United States and how it applied specifically to COVID-19 treatment. She started out with 687 potential articles, which is huge. It's a huge amount of research. And of course, she couldn't look at all of that. So she applied that screening and apply that eligibility. And she ended up with 30 core articles that she used in her scoping review. That, and then she charted each of those papers. The uh, title of her thesis was Investigating Telehealth in the COVID-19 Pandemic, a Scoping Review. And that's just a note uh, to you as well, is that when these articles are produced, they like that this, a scoping review be in the title that helps people know what it is. So in summary and wrap up, uh, scoping reviews can be, they have helpful guidelines already in place so that you can feel confident in using them and that you can go through a process with them. Um, note, to, note to you as well, they're not less work than a systematic review. And that was an impression that I had in the beginning, but they are uh, a lot of work. They are just a different purpose uh, than a scoping uh, scoping reviews different purpose than systematic review. Scoping reviews are really great for broad, evolving, and complex questions. And with that, I'd like to take questions from you. Okay. We might have time for one question, but we're losing time. I must be talking too much in between our speakers. <laughs> You're doing great. And I'll re remind everybody about the dot storming that is in the chat. And now we have Carrie. Go ahead as soon as you're ready, Carrie. Sorry, I just needed to unmute my microphone there. Hi, all. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. So I'm Carrie Didion, and I'm the science librarian at Governor State University. And I'm going to walk you through how we or how the library helped take our human cadaver lab online. Um, just a real quick, a uh, little bit about uh, Governor State University um, we, or GSU as it's known. Um, we're kind of that gem in the Southlands of uh, Chicago. We're 40 miles directly south of uh, downtown. We offer the lowest tuition of any four-year public university in Illinois. And we're small, you know, we're a smaller college um, or a university. Uh, we're not as big as the University of Illinois. Our fall 2020 FTE was about 3,200. And then um, 1,000 of that would be our graduate students. So I'm the science librarian. I liaise with um, physical therapy and occupational therapy programs. And this is just a little bit from their website, uh, talking about their programs. The, the Doctor of Physical Therapy program is an intensive 119 credit hours. Um, they do advertise straight up front that the anatomy lab work is performed on actual cadavers. Um, the Master of Occupational Therapy is also an intensive program, 102 credit hours, and they advertise um, a thorough understanding of anatomy and physiology. So um, having a human cadaver lab is pretty important to both programs. Um, both the MOT and the DPT cohort start in the summer. Um, they combine, there's 36 um, students in each, since we are a smaller school, so it's 72 students who do take that gross anatomy lab. Um, and then to supplement, you know, the library has a model collection that they can also use to, to study and, and work with um, outside of lab and outside of lecture. Uh, but in 2018 and 19-ish, the OT program was beginning a transition from this gross anatomy lab to a more functional anatomy course. Um, just because of accreditation terms and, and whatnot. So their department chair and the potential anatomy instructor contacted me uh, to discuss some options to supplement their new curriculum. Uh, I should mention too that Illinois suffered a, uh, we went without a state budget for two and a half years. So those um, cuts really impacted us. And then summer 2020, COVID changes everything, right? GSU closes like the rest of the world. No on-campus courses are taught. MOT and DPT programs, they did have limited access to labs, but we had to rapidly between March and May come up with and purchase supplemental products for both programs. Um, we did eventually uh, use CARES funding for that. 
And I'm sure bigger libraries and, and medical centers are, have great um, tools. Uh, this is one of the tools that we um, uh, updated in our transition here. It's called um, Visible Body. We had perpetual access to Visible Body here. Um, it's 3D integrations of the body systems. Um, our perpetual access was old, and so the instructors kind of shied away from it. They didn't use it uh, because it was uh, browser heavy and, and just not great. So when we upgraded it, we were able to upgrade to um, uh, apps to, for, for iPads and that type of thing. But we also added some courseware. And the OT program in particular, um, they chose this course, courseware um, tools. And so you can see it, it, they can build a course, there's a grade book, there's assignments, uh, but it also uses the anatomy um, things that are already within. And so um, it's got nice visualizations. It has um, you know, different things here that students can work with. And the library was able to supplement um, the tools here in Visible Body. So that was one thing that we upgraded. The other thing that we added was the Auckland Video Atlas of Human Anatomy, which is a really, really great um, um, program because it is actual human cadavers uh, that are, are um, already cut and splayed and they're on video here and you can kind of go through and look at them. You can see muscle groups, um, you can see fatty tissue. So it walks you through all of those different parts. So instead of physically, cutting open a cadaver, they had a cadaver here that they could use um, in these video segments. Uh, we also upgraded our LICE, our ICE, our LICE, our ICE Learning Center, uh, which is um, videos for that clinical piece. So like here, we can see a baby creeping. So that stuff that they couldn't do while they were um, away from the field, they could kind of watch um, different things. And so we upgraded our subscription here. Um, and then the last thing we added was this FAPT Davis. And that's just uh, expanded our textbook collection for both physical therapy and occupational therapy programs. And so lastly, we had some really good feedback from our faculty, our growth anatomy um, professor who's really diehard into the anatomy piece. She loved, loved, loved Auckland. And she kind of says that here. And then um, Visible Body with that courseware pack really helped kind of bundle it together and make it more of a functional piece. Um, and then again, the, those videos, um, we have another review here for those videos. So um, we took, you know, what we had and what we could work with and we moved it online successfully. So that's all that I have for you guys today. Um, thank you. My contact information is here and I'm so happy to be here. The last one boot camp I attended was at Purdue. So it's been a while. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carrie. Looks like your library was um, really successful in reaching out to people during COVID when we couldn't be together. Yeah, it was a mad dash. It was a mad dash and we were just so grateful for that funding too. Great. Kimberly is getting ready to go. All righty. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Thank you for having me here. This is my first Great Lakes Science Bootcamp. Um, I am Kim from the University at Buffalo. Today I'm talking about a guide that my colleague and I created about um, or for Great Lakes research. Oh, technical problems, here we go. Sorry about that. Um, so I am a science librarian and I manage our map collection at UB. Carolyn is a social sciences librarian and she manages the government documents collection. Uh, so we thought that creating a guide to resources for the Great Lakes would be a great way to collaborate and really call on all of our areas of expertise here. We applied for the Carnegie Whitney grant from the American Library Association, uh, which is intended to um, fund um, fun guides uh, for all library patrons. Uh, so we created our guide, not just for the university community, but also keeping in mind public library patrons, uh, as well as, you know, just hobbyists and children. Um, oh, and I should note that funding for the guide that we use, we actually had at first intended to use it for digitization efforts, but because of COVID, we um, actually uh, hired a student assistant to help create the guide, especially our interactive pieces. Uh, so we were funded by the American Library Association, and of course we do have greater expertise in those resources being in the US, uh, but we do recognize also that Canada 
borders the Great Lakes. So we provide jumping off points for resources uh, for, uh, for, Canadi for Canadian resources on our guide. And this is just a snippet of um, one of those jumping off points on the government information page. So today I am just going to be showing snippets of the guide. Obviously, I didn't want to wrestle with Zoom jumping from a screen share to uh, my uh, from my PowerPoint to my browser. Uh, but so the most important piece you need to know are the URLs, and I have two here. Um, the first, the top one is the university sanctioned URL, and the bottom one is one that is a little bit easier to remember: tinyurl slash essential Great Lakes. For our homepage, we really wanted to lure people into the guide. So Caroline created this wonderful, wonderful graphic with um, Canva on the left, and she just included some uh, stunning visuals and uh, interesting facts. And on the right hand side is just from the bottom of that homepage, we have some of the uh, more funny videos and overview videos that are found on YouTube. Uh, for people that maybe aren't so familiar with the lakes. You can navigate through the guide through the top panel here. You can see there are nine topics right now. Uh, those that are bolded have additional subtopic pages. My favorite is our cartographic and geospatial resources page. Uh, we have subpages for historical maps and charts, uh, contemporary maps, and GIS data. And I had a really fun time finding historical maps and linking out to the libraries that have digitized those. Our government information page is where you will find the interactive timeline. Uh, this was created using timeline JS and users can actually just click right through. Of course, these are just screenshots, but you can see major events in Great Lakes legislative history. And right now, Carolyn is working on a way to um, make this aspect of the guide screen reader friendly. Of course, we have pages for environment. The main page covers climate change, uh, water quality, and overfishing, but we also have flora and fauna and geology. History, there is a lot to unpack with that, so it has the most subpages right now. Um, the shipwrecks page is actually the favorite amongst our colleagues, so if you have any interest in shipwrecks, please do check that one. And the most important page for uh, attendees today is probably the Great Lakes Library and Research Programs page. Uh, this is where we list libraries that have collections focusing on either one or all of the Great Lakes, um, whether they're digitized or not, as well as university programs and um, and degrees. So if you don't see a library listed here you're aware of, please do let me know so that we can add that to the guide. We plan to uh, add more recent scholarly articles and a few subtopic pages. So this guide is evolving. If you have any comments or suggestions, please do let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Wow, I can't wait to go spend a whole lot more time looking at your guide. Great, thanks. <laughs> Looks really helpful. Good. All right, I think we better move on to Rachel. All right, thanks everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Awesome, hello. Um, so my name is Rachel Martinez. Um, I use she, they pronouns and I am the STEM librarian at Arizona State University. So I work with Renee Tanner and we're all very sad that she's leaving us, but we wish her the best at Rollins College. Um, and the title of my presentation is Engaging and Actually Being of Use to BIPOC and First Gen Faculty. Um, this presentation is super condensed to fit this lightning talk, but I want to acknowledge that this is an ongoing initiative and conversation that goes well beyond the next five minutes. And I hope to be able to present with some of my colleagues on that in future uh, science boot camps. All right, so before we get started, I wanted to go over some terms. Um, BIPOC in this case is Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. Uh, first gen here, uh, we've been using that to describe those who are the first to attend college, grad school, or work in academia um, in their families or their environment. Uh, so uh, here at Arizona State University, we occupy the lands of the Akimel and Akimel Odom and Pipash peoples. 
Um, we're also one of the largest universities in the United States. I believe the last stat was that we had over um, 120,000 uh, students. So um, yeah, pretty big. Uh, also our faculty ranks are overwhelmingly right, white despite our student population being um, more diverse than that. And of those faculty, less than 3% of all tenure track faculty positions are held by BIPOC folks. So it is pretty abysmal um, in, that, in that sense here. And I feel like we are not the only ones um, who, who have those kinds of stats uh, here in the United States. So um, tenure track faculty, I'm sure that this, that this is the same at many other um, institutions, large research in institutions, but just for posterity, um, I got this from the provost um, website here at our university. Tenure is an appointment awarded by the university president um, to a faculty member who has demonstrated excellence in teaching research and scholarly or creative activities in accordance with the standards established, set forth by uh, the university and academic units. So the general path that folks usually take is they start off as an assistant professor, which is kind of like an entry level. Um, and then there's usually about six years in between assistant and associate. That's where they obtain tenure. And then they have the option of going to full professor. Um, so we help a lot of folks who are making the jump from assistant to associate. Um, and the process of obtaining tenure is very stressful. Um, so faculty members must submit a tenure package. And that means that they, in that package contains a list of at least 10 potential external reviewers, a full and comprehensive CV, a personal statement, publication or creative materials that demonstrate scholarly excellence and evidence of teaching and mentoring. And the publication or creative materials is where a lot of folks get tripped up because um, there's a lot of disciplines who will um, favor one type of venue where folks can publish uh, over another. And so they consider that a higher research impact. Um, and so sometimes that's not super straightforward and that adds to the stress. Um, so here at ASU, we have the library's researcher support team. So we partner with our knowledge enterprise and development unit here at ASU. Um, and that is kind of the, that's the researcher support for the entire university. But here at the library, we're a group of um, librarians, data scientists, um, and other types of experts and researchers who support researchers at every stage of their research. So we work with faculty on literature reviews, preparing grant proposals, and that'll include data management plans um, and also literature reviews, um, citation management and data management tools, data storage. Um, and the big one is publishing guidance, uh, particularly with respect to bibliometrics and research impact. Um, our overall goal is that we wanna provide targeted support to BIPOC and first-gen faculty. And we know that academia is convoluted. It's very much a who you know environment that benefits those who have an in, and that's very few. Um, and so we want to make the tenure process as accessible as possible. Um, we can't change the rules. We can't change, you know, what is considered um, high impact or not. But what we can do is directly support these folks. And right now we are in the process of uh, revamping our web pages to uh, advertise for workshops. Um, we're providing outreach to specific BIPOC faculty groups. Um, we have uh, a Latinx faculty group, um, Black and African American faculty group, also Indigenous faculty groups. Um, and so we're also um, going to feature blog posts that feature faculty who have faced common obstacles seen in academia. Um, one faculty member that I'm, talk talk I'm talking to uh, talked about the research output um, disparity during the work from home phase of the, of the pandemic. And we also want to partner with, on faculty projects rather than providing only point of need. We want to be partners in, in folks' research. And um, that means that we, that we are there from the very beginning. And with that, I think that is the end of my presentation. And thank you very much. Thank you. I'm just getting more inspired by everyone's talks, of things that I should be doing. <laughs> And we are down to our last talk with, with, from Megan.
<clears throat> Last and not least, I'm sure. <laughs> I know, right? I hate starting right at two. I'm sorry. I will try to be fast, but this is um, not a quick topic. <laughs> okay, so hi, I'm Megan. Um, I'm the science librarian at UNC Greensboro. And today I'm going to talk about how scientists can enlist the public to contribute to research using citizen science. Things popping up in the way. Okay, so since it's not that widely known, I first want to explain the concept of citizen science. Um, technically, it's the practice of public participation in scientific research. And in a way, researchers are crowdsourcing science, but it can really be so much more than that. Um, citizen science is an invitation to everyone to participate on topics that they care about. And this participation can take many forms. Um, and so to help people kind of understand how the public can contribute in huge ways, um, one story that I like to kind of use is the story of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So the SDSS created the most detailed three-dimensional maps of the universe ever made. The maps contain, contain spectra for more than 3 million astronomical units, and the volume of information being collected are just staggering, and the future projects promise data sets of ever-increasing size. So when the new survey telescope begins operations next year, its camera be, will be able to collect 15 to 30 terabytes of data every night. So with such huge volumes of data comes the need for an increased ability to handle them. Um, the initial images from this project were about 900,000 pictures of galaxies, and they were being classified by just a handful of people at Oxford including a graduate student, Chris Lintott. So Lintott calculated that one graduate student classifying images for 12 hours per day could only classify about 50,000 in one month. But he realized that it doesn't take years of studying astrophysics to recognize a galaxy's shape. Um, and it, it only takes a little bit of practice and that really anyone from school children to retirees could do it. So instead of subjecting one person to such a huge task, um, he thought that what if this could be distributed to volunteers? So in 2007, Lintot developed Galaxy Zoo and called upon volunteers to look at digital images of galaxies and classify them as spirals, ellipticals, or mergers. So when Galaxy Zoo launched, participants classified 70,000 galaxies in the first hour um, within those first days, or sorry, per hour in those first days, and 50 million in the first year. And 14 days later, Galaxy Zoo is still running and is really that first example of how much of an impact um, the public can help researchers with. So this is just one type of project. Um, the main types that are gaining popularity right now are web-based, uh, field-based, and games. So web-based projects are just that. They're projects that can be done completely online. They don't require participants to go into the field or leave their computer. And these projects are designed to appeal to the widest range of volunteers and are typically asking participants to do simple tasks like classify galaxies, but they can process the largest amounts of data. So the other side of that are field-based projects in which the researcher relies on data collected by participants. The variety of these projects range from collecting and analyzing water or soil samples, um, taking measurements, pictures or sound clips, um, monitoring urban areas to growing mold in your house and many more. Um, so you're really only limited to uh, by your imagination when it comes to these types of projects. Uh, the only thing about field-based projects that the, is that they do require attention to explaining collection protocols and best practices to participants and thinking about ways to ensure data quality. So citizen science games uh, leverage the ability of users to solve puzzles and can range from finding the best trajectory in a city with traffic um, to identifying genes, folding proteins. And the one picture here is iWire in which participants map 3D structures of neurons in the brain. Um, so since Galaxy Zoo is that web-based project, I want to show you a quick example of a field-based project that's really popular. 
So why do we want to crowdsource, in this case, biodiversity data? So let's say Steve the scientist is studying tiger swallowtail butterflies. So like many faculty over the summer, he'll pick a different region and to travel to to continue his research. Over the years, he might get some funding or some research assistance to help him study in more places, but he'll still be limited in his ability to get a full picture of where those butterflies are. So enter citizen science. Um, so instead of trying to collect all of the data himself, Steve can now use crowdsourced bio biodiversity data collected by millions of citizens worldwide. Um, so this platform is called iNaturalist. Um, and over the last 10 years, uh, 40,000 pictures of tiger swallowtails have been uploaded to this platform with important data such as time and date, location of the species. And the best part is, is that this data is open for researchers and the public to use. So we've seen really quickly that the benefits of this kind of crowdsourcing and citizen science um, for researchers is that it can process large amounts of data and process that data quickly, and it can collect a large amount of data. But um, one big question that researchers will have is how accurate is this data? Um, since I'm kind of out of time, I'm pushing it. Um, there are links and I will share this presentation, but a really big, uh, project um, has given us kind of a case study to see how accurate citizen scientists are. And the short of it is if you have multiple classifiers for each um, project or multiple people looking at the same thing, their accuracy is even more accurate than one expert in the field doing that same task. So I have links to this um, this study and some others, but there's been a lot of good candidates, I think, for this um, type of research and this type of help um, that I've seen today. And there are so many more. And if you want to learn more about uh, how you can enforce data literacy skills using citizen science, you can see my presentation at SLA coming up next month. Great. Thank you. I'm glad you met. Uh, mentioned iNaturalist because I have I have so much fun with iNaturalist. Oh, I'm obsessed. It's it's a really sick obsession at this point. <laughs> yeah. Well, we are up to time for a break. A short break. We'll start again at two fifteen, right, Danny? Uh, let's go ahead and do two twenty. Okay. Uh, give people a little bit of more time. Uh, uh, we'll start about just a few minutes late. Uh, and don't forget to vote. We'll be doing voting until 4.30 and the links to voting is in the chat. All right.
For those just joining us, we're going to get started at 2.20, just a few minutes late because lightning talks went a few minutes over.